It's a hell one. Today we're listening to a guy defending hell. Somebody sent this to me a while ago. I wasn't in the mood for it. I think you can understand me often not being in the mood for this kind of stuff, and I'm still not really in the mood for it, but I'm less not in the mood for it, so it seems like as good a time as any. Yeah, a big contributing factor to why I stopped wanting to worship the biblical God is because I did not like the idea of him torturing or even annihilating those that I loved and cared about that simply didn't believe in him. So the guy's responding to this TikTok video that he found. And so just to repeat the key point of what she said, she said she wanted to stop worshipping God because she thought he was going to take the people that she loves and either send them to hell or annihilate them. She doesn't say she stopped believing in him over this. She says she stopped wanting to worship him over this. I just want to make sure that nobody watching missed that distinction. I had plenty of non-Christian friends that I considered to be genuinely good people. But because they didn't believe in God, I had to believe that they were evil and that they were going to be justly tortured for all of eternity. Yeah, you had to believe that just by being unconvinced, they've committed an infinitely bad offense that deserves infinite punishment. Which amounts to believing that they're evil, because how could someone do an infinitely bad thing, the worst possible thing, and not be considered evil if you believe being evil means anything at all? And so it seems like she started to think, you guys tell me this is the worst possible behavior. It's infinitely bad for someone to just hear something and not be convinced by it. But I don't think I believe you anymore. It's not true just because you say it. Sounds like that's about where she was at. Okay, let's talk about this because there's lots of misconceptions about hell out there. And it sounds like she has some, even while she was, you know, she considered herself to be a Christian, she had some misconceptions about it as well. No, what she just said was pretty accurate to the Christian idea about hell. I mean, obviously she's saying it without the usual Christian spin, trying to make it sound better than it is. But at the basic level, it's the thing. She doesn't have a misconception. And not to spoil anything, but you're not even going to disagree in this video with anything she said about hell. It's not like you have some different idea about the subject or about what sends you there. That is not what the disagreement in this video is about. She says that she understood her friends to be pretty much good people, right? And so why would they go to hell? Well, it actually gets to the core foundation of like who we are as people. Are we intrinsically good? Are we intrinsically evil? Right, and that's what the disagreement is about. She ceased to believe that her friends were in fact infinitely evil and deserving of infinite torture. This guy thinks they are. So again, from this guy's perspective, she actually doesn't have any misconceptions about hell. From his perspective, the only thing she said that reveals any sort of a misconception is that she doesn't think humans are infinitely evil. If it's a misconception, as he thinks it is, it's a misconception about human nature and the moral gravity of non-belief, not about hell. Uh, you know, according to the Bible, if we're going to go with the Bible here, if we're going to call ourselves a Christian, then we got to go with what the word of God says. And we say, okay, well, the Bible says that we've all fallen short of the glory of God, that we're all dead in our trespasses and sins. Okay, neither of which says that people are infinitely evil and deserving of infinite torture. I doubt that when this young lady was a Christian, she would have disagreed with you on the point that people have sinned. I really doubt that she would have disagreed with you that the Bible says it. And in fact, I also kind of doubt that she would have disagreed with you that God himself believes and says in his word that people have sinned and deserve infinite torture in hell for it. What she said was, I believed God did this and that made me want to not worship him. In other words, that she ceased to believe that she was worshiping this all-loving, all-good God that everybody insists they're worshiping, and realized that if she was worshiping a God at all, it certainly was not all good and all loving, and I don't want to put words in her mouth here, but if Christians believe a God is to be defined as intrinsically all good and all loving, that maybe this thing wasn't even really a god at all. Maybe it was actually some kind of evil supernatural entity that wrote these words, some kind of demon. I definitely don't know if she was thinking that. That's me thinking my own thoughts and thinking, if I were in that position, I would probably be thinking something along those lines. Maybe she was too, or maybe somebody in a similar position would be. And I think it's entirely valid because putting someone into hell for infinite torture doesn't match anything that I understand the word love to mean. If somebody calls that love, then they've radically redefined that word to mean something that I don't acknowledge it meaning. In fact, the redefinition is so radical at that point that love now seems to be defined as hate. It's exact opposite. And just as a matter of preserving the meaning of language, I'm not going to go along with that. And it seems that neither is she. And you might even look at that and say, okay, well, I can understand that we've sinned. And so there might be some punishment that is due, but really like hell for all of eternity, that's pretty extreme. A lot of people have that perspective. Yeah, of course. And I don't think there's much more to add to that right now in terms of hell being extreme. 
I think what I would add, though, is that it's also really stupid. By which I mean this entire system makes God seem like a dumbass. Because what is the purpose of this punishment? Well, it's to make people behave in a certain way. That's the point of a punishment. Say you have someone who's going around robbing houses. You're going to punish that person for a number of reasons. One of them is to protect people from future robberies, specifically by taking away that person's ability to commit more robberies. In various times and places, that's meant prison, or death, or removal of the hands, or exile. The second reason is to make that person think twice once the punishment is over. So if you sent that person to prison, maybe once that person gets out of prison, he'll think, wow, I don't want to go back, and then maybe consider not reoffending. Or if you sentence that person to lashes, same deal. I don't want more of that. And the final reason is to prevent other people from doing that same thing. People see whatever punishment it is that that guy got and they go, ooh, I was thinking about doing that, but maybe I won't. So those are the three basic reasons for punishment. And apparently, according to Christianity, this is basically what God is trying to do. To discourage this horrible crime of not believing the story of Jesus. That's why there's this endless finger wagging about it. You better believe it, it's gonna get bad if you don't, you better believe it. Look at the horrible punishment that's coming for you if you don't. But the problem with this, and what makes God look so stupid if he's actually doing this, is that all the punishment takes place behind a curtain. You can't see it. You don't even really get a good reason to believe it's happening. You just get Christians insisting that it is, and doing things like pointing to the Bible and saying, look, the Bible says this, to people who don't believe the Bible is in fact the word of God. And so this punishment serves no purpose. It doesn't protect anyone from anything. No harm seems to come to anyone from someone just not believing the thing. But even if it did, they're allowed to wander around in life not believing the thing for a whole lifetime, and they're only punished after they die, after all their ability to potentially cause whatever harm might be proposed is already totally exhausted. It doesn't deter others from doing the same thing because there's no actual evidence of the punishment even happening. If you wanted to deter people, you would make it very, very, very obvious what's happening to the people who died without believing. This would be accessible, visible, undeniable. And finally, it doesn't deter the person who committed this crime from doing it again because there's not going to be a chance to do it again. This person's going to be in the punishment phase for the rest of eternity. There's no redemption, no restoration, no learning of the lesson and seeing the light. This person whose crime was not believing the claim, now presented with very solid evidence of the claim, is never given the chance to say, okay, I was mistaken, thank you for the information, I believe you now, I'll repent and stop doing the crime. Despite the fact that if this god is all loving and all good and really desires the repentance of everyone and the salvation of everyone, it would enthusiastically accept such a response regardless of whether you died first. And that's the last reason why, if God is really doing this this way, it makes him look like such a dunce. The demand is that people change their beliefs, just by sheer force of will, which is not possible. Your beliefs change when you're presented with something that convinces you, even if that something is a feeling or manipulation or something really silly like that. Your beliefs change when you become become convinced. And these people have not become convinced. God has not provided them that which he knows will convince them, and therefore they can't believe. God is withholding the convincing material on purpose, and then acting as if their inevitable response is deserving of infinite punishment. Either he's not a loving God, or he's a complete moron who just doesn't understand the problem, and has no idea how to effectively achieve his goals. And so this analogy might give you some help on this. So, you know, if I were to lie to my little brother, nothing would happen really. Like he's my little brother. I can lie to him and like it's bad, you know, I did a bad thing, but like ultimately the consequences of, of that aren't going to be that extreme. Depends on what the lie is about. If it's extreme enough, he might grab his pocket knife and send you to the hospital. If I lie to my parent, let's say I was a little bit younger and I was still like a teenager and I lied to my parent, the consequences of that would be more severe. I might get grounded or some of my privileges might be taken away. Right. Why is that? Well, there are two main reasons I can think of. One would just be vindictiveness. Your parents are just weak-minded, angry, emotional little goblins. And they go, yeah, you made me mad. I'm going to take it out on you. You're grounded, mister. Mmm, that makes me feel better. Or, the lie you told was serious in a way that shows something that's going to be a problem in your character in the future. Something that will cause a problem in the relationships of the family or with your friends, and something that's going to cause a problem for you going forward in your life. And so, with good intentions, your parents punish that behavior to try to discourage you from doing it in the future. Now, whether this is really the best way to approach this kind of stuff, I don't know. 
I haven't had to do that yet with my kid, but she's only eight, so get back to me once she's a teenager and we'll talk. But regardless of whether it's the best option, with a wise parent, that option is chosen for the reason of shaping future behavior to try to improve the future life of the kid. The parent loves the child and so has the child's best interests in mind and wants to help the child to improve, in the sense of being better able to operate within the world in the way that the parent thinks is the most beneficial. So between these two options, we have two very different kinds of parents. We have the one that's not operating out of love. We have the one that's operating just out of pettiness, rage, small-mindedness, you know, punishment for the sake of punishment and self-gratification, like hell. And we have the one that's operating out of love, trying to act as a guide, as a mentor, trying to lead the child to the better path. And you'll notice that in that case, it's not really the punishment that's the point. It's the outcome of it. It's the fact that what's expected by the parent is a better outcome from doing the punishment than from not doing it. Better for the child, I mean. And ultimately, in the long term, for the relationship between the parent and the child. Um, if I were to lie to a cop, you know, a police officer, man, the, the, the consequences of that scenario would definitely be heightened quite a bit more. Yeah, possibly. Anyway, there are plenty of cases where people lie to cops and the cops know it, but nothing happens. But there is an option for punishment available, essentially to make people afraid to lie to the cops. The reason being that if people are less likely to lie to cops because they're kind of nervous to do it, then at least the people who put that law in think that will make police investigations easier. The police will have an easier time accessing true information. This is not an issue of love. The justice system doesn't love you. The cops don't love you. They don't care at all. The love reason, the mentoring and guiding reason, that's not even a factor. But when they do a punishment like this, it's for a clear reason. And it's not really exactly about the fact that the person you lied to was a cop. It's more about the fact that you're obstructing a certain outcome that the people who made the rules want to achieve. If they had some outcome they wanted to realize that could be realized by you not being allowed to lie to your little brother under penalty of perjury, they might consider a rule like that too. And then lying to your little brother would be exactly equivalent to lying to a cop. If I were to lie to a judge, that would be perjury, and I would be sent to jail. You might be. Again, that's not universally true. Not by a long shot. In fact, I suspect that most of the time when people lie to judges, they're not convicted of perjury. For one obvious thing, when you talk to a judge, you're not always under oath. But for another thing, the judge isn't necessarily always going to jump to that extreme, even if you are. Again, though, this isn't really about lying to a judge. It's not about who you're lying to. It's about what the outcome of your lie is, what the consequences are. If you're lying in court under oath, that could result in the freeing of a very dangerous guilty person, and it could result in the conviction of a very innocent person. There are serious consequences to this lie, real consequences to real people. People can be hurt by this. So the reasons for rules like this are the same as the reasons for rules about lying to cops. Something's on the line for somebody, and your lies might be putting that at risk. Do you notice how in all of these situations where there's a rule against lying and there's some sort of a consequence for it, there's an actual reason why this is being discouraged? It's not about who's the toughest or who has the most people with guns standing behind them. It's not about who claims the fanciest title or the most authority. There's a point to these things. Sometimes in society we encounter rules that we disagree with fundamentally. You know, we disagree with the point. But the point is there's usually still a point. Somebody's trying to accomplish something by putting that rule in. And that applies to every one of your examples about people with authority over you. So by extension, you would think, considering these are the examples you chose, this should also apply to God. But as I discussed before, it doesn't. Even at this point, before you finished, the analogy's broken. So the lie didn't change. It was a lie each time, but who I committed the act against did change. Sure, but who it is isn't really the point. For example, take that same judge, but instead of you being a witness under oath or something, you're on the golf course just having a day out with him. He's still a judge. He's still the same person that he was. But you can lie to him all day long. Nothing's going to happen other than he gets kind of annoyed. Same with the cop. Same with your parents once you're a bit older. As you said, that applies when you're a bit younger, not so much once you're older. It's not about who you commit the act against. It's about the context and about certain rules that are put in place to try to achieve certain goals in certain contexts. That's what rules are. They're attempts by people with limited power but some amount of power to try to encourage certain behavior in other people that will help them to reach a certain state of things that they could not reach otherwise through their own power because they don't have that power. 
For example, the cop and the judge don't have the ability to read your mind. The reason they need rules in place to try to discourage you from lying is that they don't know what you actually think. They lack power, and the rule is an attempt to try to gain a little bit more power, a little bit more ability to know what you think. And likewise, your parent doesn't have the power to ensure that your life going forward is going to go well, that you're going to make good decisions, but your parent does have the power to try to encourage certain kinds of socially beneficial behavior now, with the hope that maybe that will help you to have a better life later. Your parent lacks the power to guarantee the best for you in your social relationships in the future, but uses this tool of punishment in an attempt to hopefully affect that future for the better. It's an attempt by a person to try to use the little bit of power they have to alter a future that for them is mostly impossible to control. If any of these people had total knowledge and total power, none of this would be necessary. It would all be completely pointless. They wouldn't have to use these mostly impotent little tools like implementing rules and enforcing them to try to get the outcomes they want, they would just get the outcomes they want. So when you commit an act against God, who is completely holy, infinitely holy, right, something super small to us might seem insignificant. To God, it is an infinite offense, and thus the punishment is eternity in hell. Oh, okay, so the seriousness of a punishment doesn't scale with the offense, which again is how it works in all the examples that you gave. You said it scales with who you commit the offense against, but that's actually not the case. It scales with what the offense is and what the rules about it are in the system and how the system enforces it. But no, it doesn't scale with that. It scales with who you commit the offense against, not in terms of their authority over you, which is what I thought you meant, because you were going from your little brother to your parent to the police to a judge, which seems like you're thinking in terms of escalating authority. But no, apparently punishments scale with the holiness of the person you offend against, and holiness just happens to scale with authority or power. So this apparent scale Scaling with authority or power is just a byproduct of the scaling with holiness. Which would mean that your little brother is the least holy, your parent is more holy, a cop is more holy, and the judge is more holy. And so the reason why lying to a judge under oath will have worse consequences typically than lying to your parent, although that's far from universally true, but the reason why apparently this is universally true has nothing to do with the reasons why perjury laws are made or the reasons why parents ground their children to try to discourage lying. No, reasons don't factor into it, context doesn't matter, the severity of the consequences doesn't matter, not even the actual differences about what it is to lie to your parent about where you were till 11 o'clock versus lying to a judge about whether you saw that guy kill that guy. No, a lie is a lie is a lie is a lie, it's all the same thing, details be damned, and the badness of a lie just scales with the holiness of the person you tell it to. That's it, that's what we're talking about here, that's what your examples show, that's what your analogy shows apparently, and God's got lots of holiness holiness, so any kind of reasons or purpose be damned, if you lie to the god that already knows what you think, you deserve infinite torture. Okay, just absurd non sequitur, your supposed analogy has no relevance whatsoever, or if it does it diminishes the point you're trying to make. Yeah, just a complete train wreck. One more thought here before we move on. I think your analogy really betrays something very dark about your personality. You use the example of lying, but to generalize it a little bit more, the idea is that when you do something wrong to someone else, it's deserving of more punishment and that person is more holy if they hold more power over you. So for example, if you're an adult and you find a random child and do something horrible to him that results in you burying him in a shallow hole, I'm trying not to be too direct about this for YouTube, that's less bad, it's deserving of less punishment, than if you're a child and you do a similar thing to your incredibly controlling, abusive, violent parent. By your standard, the adult who does the thing to the child should get off far lighter than the child who does the thing to the abusive parent. The child you committed this crime against held less power over you and therefore was less holy. The parent held more power over you and thus was more holy. If that's your standard of what's a reasonable way to make distinctions between these kind of situations, just hatred and devil valuation of the powerless and the glorification and elevation of people with power no matter what, being more bothered by trespasses against some random judge than against your little brother. Well, I guess just don't be surprised by people's reaction to your defense of God here. She says how she didn't want to see them as evil and deserving of hell. Well, we need to understand that we are not above them, right? Like, it's not like we're as Christians saying, oh, they're so evil and why are they so bad and why am, you know, I'm so good and I'm going to heaven because I'm a nice guy. It's like, not the point. 
you are told to see them as infinitely evil and deserving of hell. Yeah, okay, maybe you're told to see yourself that way too. These are not mutually exclusive. You can do both. What she's saying is she doesn't believe it at all. You saying, well, I believe it about everyone, including myself, really doesn't address the point. That's not a biblical or Christian perspective. It's that we have all sinned and all fallen short of the glory of God. Yeah, we know. I would assume she knows too. But the point is this. You believe that you, being a believer, will go to heaven and it will be just. It must be because, of course, God's justice is perfect. Justice is served by you not going to hell, not getting punished at all, and going to heaven. Because you believe. And you believe that the people who don't believe will justly go to hell for all of eternity. Now, you can say the actual crime that you've committed is falling short of the glory of God, and that Jesus came and sacrificed himself to take that sin upon himself and take it off of you. Fine, so the actual crime that's getting someone sent to hell is not just this general original sin that applies to everybody. You have that too to the same extent, and Jesus took the burden of it for you to the same extent as for them. No, what's sending them to hell is simply not believing. Whether having original sin or touching your pee-pee in the bathroom is also an infinitely egregious crime is not really the point because it's not the crime that's actually relevant to the consequence. The relevant crime is unbelief. The crime that you didn't commit, or at least stopped committing before the deadline. And so unbelief is a crime for which the just punishment is infinite torture in fire. It's that egregious, and therefore yes, these people are evil. What the hell else does it mean to commit a crime that bad, deserving of something that awful? They've done something they deserve infinite torture for, and you haven't. Except for the ones that have been scapegoated away and don't count anymore. So they're more evil than you. You don't deserve that. God's just Justice wouldn't put you in hell. They deserve it. God will justly toss them away. You. You're trying to get out of just saying what the religion implies by playing a bunch of stupid little word games. Not interested. And it is only by God's grace that I'm saved, right? It's like I'm a beggar that's looking for bread, that, and I've found that bread. Right, so you're a beggar, and God's like the dictator tyrant, and you're lying there on a doorstep, starving, hoping for some bread, and he rolls by in his golden carriage, and you glance at his carriage and go, <sighs> and the carriage stops, and he climbs out, and he draws his sword, and he cuts your head off with one swing, and he says, Puh, look what you made me do. How dare you? How dare you? You, the powerless, the poor, the weak, you scum. How dare you transgress against one such as me by sighing. Look at my golden carriage. Do you not see my holiness? Disgusting poors, they have no appreciation. And everybody cheers and claps because yeah, you know what? He's got a point somehow. And now we're called as Christians to share that good news. It's not like God has hung us out to dry here. He's given us a path out of this judgment that we rightfully deserve through Jesus' sacrifice. That's the whole point of the gospel. That's the whole point of Christianity. No, he hasn't. If you're not convinced that it's true, if you're not convinced that he exists and that Jesus did this thing and everything, then no, he hasn't. He's withholding the information that would convince you. So he's opened the path to some and not to others, but not relevant anyway to whether the punishment fits the crime or whether these people really are evil or whether this course of action makes any sense at all or whether your analogy makes any sense at all or whether might makes right or whether a god like this is considered worthy of worship. Your whole Jesus salvation story is really just a random side issue. When this girl had these concerns as a Christian, she was a Christian. She was aware of what you're saying right now. She's still aware of it. Going into this is just pointless. And when you're young, you just accept this. But as you get older and you start grappling with your own morality, you start to wonder how this is just. And I was yeah, grappling with your own morality. L listen how she she puts that. <laughs> yes, you either are stuck with God's objective morality or you're you're subjected with your own morality. No, you're always stuck with your own morality. Doesn't matter if you believe in God, you try to follow God's morality and so on. Ultimately, everything is interpreted through your mind. If you become convinced that whatever God does is moral, well, now that's your morality. That's the morality you have been convinced to adopt. If you read the Bible and you interpret the words and you try to figure out what exactly God wants you to do, and based on that understanding you accept whatever that is, well now that's your morality. There's no escaping this. You don't operate by God's morality. You operate by your own morality, which maybe you've attempted to align to God's morality, but it's still your morality. It's still what you think is right and wrong. 
when you say that's right and that's wrong, that's you saying it. It's not God saying it for you. And so because of this inevitable fact, what you'll notice is that across Christianity, there's a vast difference in moral opinions. Just in modern day Christianity, the differences are incredible. And it gets even more extreme if you take all of the historical opinions of Christians as well. I'm not going to pretend for you that all these people are following God's one true perfect objective morality. What's the alternative here? Well, am I the judge of God? Yes, your opinions of God are necessarily you judging God. If you judge him to be perfect and loving and good, that's the same as you judging him to be imperfect and unloving and bad. Whenever you come to an opinion about something, that's you being the judge. So all of this right now, for example, is you judging God to be justified in his eternal torture of millions and billions of people because they're less powerful and therefore less holy than him. You're the judge. Like I'm gonna judge God for the way that he conducts himself? That's what this video is. You're the judge handing down a ruling. You've thought about this, you've come to some sort of conclusion about this, and this is what you think about God. This is your judgment. So your objection can't really be, we shouldn't judge God. Your objection is, we shouldn't judge God negatively. I judge him positively, he judges himself positively, so so should you. Nah. I'm gonna judge God for the way that he conducts himself because it doesn't fit in my morality? Yes, if it doesn't fit in your morality, by definition you can't find it moral. That cannot be avoided. Now of course you think your morality aligns perfectly with God's morality, and so you think your morality is indistinguishable from God's morality. You think it in fact is God's morality. But it's not, it's still yours. It's just you think the two are aligned. If you didn't think that, you would start to have some concerns as a Christian. Look, where am I getting morality from if I'm just like stardust bumping into stardust? If I'm just, um, you know, an evolved animal and I have no intrinsic dignity or worth, where am I getting that standard of right and wrong and morality if I'm denying God's standard? We're not having the morality discussion. I've done that too many times recently. This month I've already done that once. It doesn't matter anyway though because she's talking about when she was a Christian. You're talking about where do you get morality if there's no God? She's not. She's talking about her God-given morality. The morality God wrote upon her heart. She was a Christian at the time, remember? That's what's in conflict with God. God versus God. And beyond that, it's completely pointless anyway, because what you're doing here is really just a backstop against people not accepting your previous points. If people don't accept the power equals holiness and hurting the weak is better than hurting the strong argument, then you could say, look, okay, maybe you don't feel that great about that, but it's gotta be good, because God is defined as being good. Whatever God does, no matter how bad it seems, is good because I say God's the definer of what good is. Stop thinking for yourself. How can you think for yourself unless God tells you what to think? Now shut up and worship him, even if it makes you want to puke. See, if we're going to cling to the Ten Commandments or, you know, what Jesus said is like, oh, good moral teaching. Oh, so if you're going to live life like a moron, then we need to embrace all of it. All or nothing. Good. Keep preaching this. This is how you get atheists. One crack and it all falls apart. And when God says... You know what? You're guilty before me and you're deserving of this. And we got to take him at his word, regardless of if it doesn't fit into our morality. Why? I mean, for one thing, just because some powerful supernatural entity tells you it's the source of all goodness and in fact what goodness is, that doesn't mean it's true. It could just be lying. And God is a proven liar. For example, he says he loves people. But if you love people, you don't send them to hell for all of eternity. Ever. No matter what. That's against the definition of love. So if words mean anything, God's a liar. And so are Christians who say he loves people. So if the Bible really is God's word, and if Christians really are telling us what God really thinks, God's a hateful liar. Why would I believe such a thing when it says that it's the origin of all morality? Because our morality is flawed. It changes every day. Look at the, uh, the world's morality and how it shifted over time. It's flawed. See, I as a lifelong atheist am probably the wrong person to be addressing this point, because to me that's exactly what makes morality functional. It's not a flaw, it's a feature. It's the most important feature. That the ways that we insist upon people treating each other in a society reflect something about how we want to live in the society. And when the way that people want to live in relation to each other changes, then their ideas about how they should live in relation to each other change. I think objective morality, the entire concept, is a farce. I think 
think it's idiotic. I don't think it's helpful. I don't think it's real. I don't even really consider it worthy of discussion. It's such a wet fart of a concept. But of course, that's all coming from a place of a total lack of religious thinking, which neither of these people have. He's obviously deeply into the religious thinking, and she was at some point. So anyway, if she wants to defend her thinking on this theological matter while she was a Christian, she can do that herself. I don't really care. We say you come to a crossroad where you have to either choose your belief or choose your empathy. You have to get choose your belief or choose your empathy. That's such an interesting way to put it, because look, it's not about um, you can feel bad for for people that are like, you know, not Christians and they're going to go to hell. Right. Like and that. That's a scary thought. That's like, a, oh, man, like I, I don't want that. Right. Because you want them to be saved. You want them to come to know Jesus and you can have that feeling. But yeah, but you don't feel bad about it, though. And you're pretty much arguing that you shouldn't because these people deserve it. Your whole video so far has been arguing that they do, in fact, deserve it. And so fuck them. The powerless who look sideways at the powerful should be harmed. And the amount of that harm should depend on how powerless and how powerful the two people people involved are. This appears to be your position on how it should work in the real world, too. Not just in fantasy godland, but in actual real life. That's why all your examples in your analogy were of real world situations where you think this kind of thinking applies. And that's easy enough to do if, unlike her, you're not swayed at all by empathy. If you do have empathy, though, once you start to realize what the Christian religion actually preaches about what God's going to do to people, it's going to start to cause you to have some conflict internally. It's going to start making you ask some questions. And you can say, look, it doesn't matter. God defines what's good, so your empathy doesn't matter. Stomp it out. Stomp it out now. Don't pay attention to that. You know, your conscience, your empathy, that little voice supposedly put in your head by God to tell you something's hideously wrong here. That's not God. That's Satan or something. Stomp it out. Stop listening to it. You can say that till you're blue in the face, but that's only going to work for so long. Eventually, people are going to start asking questions like, wait a second, I would never do anything like this to anyone I ever cared about. I wouldn't even do this to my worst enemy, the person I hate most in the world. Why is God doing this? Didn't God write his morality on our hearts? Isn't my conscience from God? Isn't my empathy from God? Why is everything God supposedly put into me, everything that makes me care for anyone, including God, telling me God's a monster? Why are these Christians telling me God loves people and wants the best for people and wants their salvation and so on and then he tortures them forever? What kind of parent would torture their child? A loving one? No, never. What kind of morality does the Christian God supposedly preach? Love for everybody? Everybody matters? Everybody has value in the eyes of God? And God acts completely contrary to this morality? The exact opposite? Why? How even? How is any of what Christians say about God consistent? If this is God we're worshipping, why does it act like the devil? There's only so long a mind can hold all these contradictions. Eventually, something's gonna crack. And if it's all or nothing, as you said before, then pretty soon it'll be nothing. Well done. The, the, the way you deal with that is not... Oh, you know what? Like, maybe they're not going to go to hell. Maybe they're just, they're cool. Like, you know, they're pretty good people. Like, okay, I'm not even going to worry about it anymore. And that makes me feel better. And she never said that at this point in her life, she didn't believe these people were going to hell. She probably did believe that. And I really doubt if having a problem with that made her feel any better at that time. She said she didn't believe this God worthy of her worship. That's a very different thing. You know, I can feel like empathy towards them. So I don't. Nice little mocking empathy dance there. What a silly person. Look, let me do a silly dance about this silly person having empathy for the billions of people being tortured eternally. You know, I want to just like let let it go and let the truth go. No, it's like, well, no, we're, we got to pursue truth regardless of how it makes us feel. So, mm. and how does it make you feel? You seem kind of cheerful about it. If you really believe all this stuff, this is a very serious and grim matter. But you're not talking in a serious and grim way. You don't seem very concerned at all. It's not about choosing your belief or choosing empathy. It's about choosing truth or choosing to make ourselves feel better by denying what is true. Well, no, I think what she was trying to say there when she said choose your belief or choose your empathy is that your empathy is something inside of you that's telling you this isn't adding up. Like this behavior of the God that I'm supposed to worship doesn't reflect anything that they tell me about it. People tell me this God acts perfectly morally and perfectly justly and cares for and loves everyone and acts totally perfectly in accordance with that at all times. And I believe that. I'm a Christian, right? But something in my head is telling me, yeah, but that's not how anyone would act if that were actually the case. When I think of my family and my friends, if they wrong me in some way, or if they don't believe something that I've said, I'm not going to 
torture them. I would never do that. And what's more, if they are doing something wrong, I have the empathy to notice that they don't intend anything wrong. They're not trying to do some egregious, infinite, unforgivable crime. They're just trying to be good people and live their life. Why, if somebody has no ill intent, would they be treated in this way? And so you have these beliefs about God, these positive, wonderful beliefs, and everything he does is great and perfect and justified and wonderful, and yet every single one of your God-given faculties tells you, this is horrific, this is off, nothing here is right. And you believe both of these at the same time. And so at some point, something's gotta give. The solution you proposed is just suppress your morality, don't care about it anymore, accept that God defines what's right and wrong, and so no matter how bad you feel about this, how wrong you feel about this, ignore it, pretend otherwise, stomp it down, stomp it out, stomp out all your God-given morality, all your God-given empathy, your God-given conscience, stomp it out, destroy it, twist it, do whatever you have to do to believe that this is okay. And I'm sure that's easy enough for you to say, because you seem to be 110% secure in your belief. You don't seem to notice any of these problems. You don't seem to give a fuck at all about anyone, frankly. Grinning your way through a video like this, upbeat chatter the whole time. But when people actually have these two conflicting views at the same time, something will have to give. It doesn't matter how many times you say might makes right or God says so, so it's right. You're going to have to do better than that to prevent people from seeing through. Give one up for the other. And I just could not give up my empathy to maintain my belief that my friends that didn't Give believe deserved eternal punishment. Give up my empathy, he mutters. Yes, just like you told her to before. It doesn't matter if you find it morally repulsive. It doesn't matter what your empathy says. Christians say whatever God says is right because he said it. So stop feeling like something's wrong. Christianity and empathy are not a good fit. And it hurts that my own family would worship and praise a God that they believe will do the same to me. Yeah, see, again, she's not talking about belief. She's talking about worshiping and praising. Her family loves the monster that will torture her more than they love her. She used to love the monster that would torture others more than she loved others. I think it's entirely fair to be a little bit burned by that. No pun intended. Ultimately, it's God who needs to transform this woman's heart to surrender her own perspective and her own morality uh, to God. Right, exactly. Give up your empathy, give up your morality. I don't know what you were confused about before. Stomp out all your feelings and then do what I, the Christian, tell you. Of course, the Christian says, this is God telling you, this is God telling you, but it's not. You're on video, I can see your mouth moving, it's you. You're not a very good ventriloquist. It's just you. I mean, let's stop talking as if any of this God stuff is real. When you say it's good because God says it's good, what you mean is it's good because I say it's good. Shut up and do what I tell you. I don't even know if you're aware of that. You might be such a true believer you don't even realize. It's hard to tell sometimes. Because right now she is judging God. She she has put, placed herself as the judge of God saying, look God, I don't think your justice is truly just. I don't think your goodness is truly good. I don't think your love is truly loving. Yeah, I mean, she as her past Christian self is saying, I have a certain understanding of what those words mean and this is not it. What God does fails on all these counts definitionally. Because most likely she would think that actions objectively do or don't fit into these categories as a Christian. And she, with her all-or-nothing Christianity, presumably, is seeing all these pieces of supposedly objective reality that are supposed to fit perfectly together, not seeming to actually do so. What she thinks is reality is butting up against what she thinks is reality, and the cracks are starting to show. And you just repeating, no really, God's right all the time, I promise, comes off as pretty irrelevant at that point. I think my definitions of what love and truth and justice are, are more valid. Okay, truth is aligning with reality, so if it doesn't seem to be doing that, it's over. There's no other definition, that's the definition. And the problem with your entire belief, your God, your objective morality, all this, is that it doesn't seem to be true. Or at best, there doesn't seem to be any good reason to think it is, and so if you do somehow turn out to be right, it seems to me you were just right because you got lucky. Which to me is good enough reason to say you're probably wrong. That's the core problem that we're not really touching on much in this video because it's not really the topic. As for justice, you could do some objective morality type excuse making. What is objective justice, you know? Love, though, there's no argument. If a parent willingly, by choice, with complete clarity of mind, tortures their child, that parent doesn't love the child. It's as simple as that. Go ask your Christian friends about this. They'll probably agree. At least if you ask about human parents. They'd probably condemn human parents for that, but I bet they'd defend God till their last breath. Hypocrites.
Now, with a human parent, it's possible that maybe something like that could happen and the parent at a different moment could love the child. For example, at that one moment, the parent's doing a horrible thing, but then at the next moment, it turns out, no, that parent was just horribly mentally disturbed. Something really crazy happened neurologically. And now the parent's like, oh my god, what did I do? I love you, I love you. That's possible, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about God. He's eternal, he's unchanging, he sees all the moments all at the same time. It's all the same to him. And he's a parent who infinitely tortures Bill of his children, so that doesn't meet the definition of love. And you can say, no, that's just your definition. Uh, no, that's the definition. That's what that word's always been used to mean. If you want to change it to mean the exact opposite, you're going to have to defend that. You're going to have to convince people that that's the new definition. I don't know why you would bother. If you mean hate, just say hate. If you mean God's going to act in an infinitely hateful way towards you, he wants the absolute worst for you, he wants infinite bad to come to you, he absolutely despises you, just say that. What's the point in replacing the definition of love with the definition of hate and then pretending like it's the same as it always was? And if that's the best Christianity has, if Christianity is like, God is love, and what God means by love is infinite eternal hatred, and therefore that's the real definition of love, then you haven't defended your God, you're just playing dumb labeling games. And so she's putting herself on this kind of high horse of saying, I need to embody this empathy. Yeah, get off your high horse of caring about others. Christians don't do that. Get with the program. For all these people, and I can't, you know, coexist with this belief that God would send people to hell because that's just so unempathetic and, and that kind of thing. Well, hey, look, if that's the truth, is that the, is that the truth? That's the real question. Yeah, I agree. If there's a God and he acts like a monster, then that's how it is. That doesn't mean your empathy's wrong. And if Monster God says, I have the most power, so I have the most holiness, so I define what's good, and if I say it's good, it's good, damn it. You can still say, nah, I'm not convinced. This whole Christian goodness definition thing, this whole authority-based, power-based thing, this whatever I say goes stuff, doesn't become objectively true just because someone insists it is. Even if there's a God and even if he says so. That's just him saying so. That doesn't prevent you from looking at that God and saying, I choose love over you. If you torture me for that, so be it. That's not a denial of truth or reality. It's making the ultimate sacrifice to stand up to a bully. It might feel, make us feel uncomfortable. It make us, may make us feel sad that people are going to hell. But what does that drive us to? Does it drive us into denial and accusing God of not being good? Speaking just practically for a second, uh, yeah, it seems to a lot. Which is why I'm happy that you keep preaching all or nothing Christianity. The Christians who take out all this stuff and water it down so people don't fall out of the religion so often are much more annoying. It makes the religion much less fragile. It also makes it much less compelling, so there's pros and cons. Or does it drive us into action and actually living out his commands on this earth to be a witness for him. Thank you so much for watching. Okay, that was an abrupt ending. Okay, well, as he said, thank you so much for watching. If you would, before you go, please do give the video a like and click subscribe. If you really like the channel, maybe consider supporting. A couple bucks per video or per month helps a huge amount, and huge thanks to all of my supporters who've already made that choice. For early access, email list, list.logic.com, and I'll see you next time.